This week is shaping up to be another wild one in Linux. Bcache FS is still catching flack, and there are many Rust maintainers expressing their concerns about working in open source in the Linux community. We're going to go into all of this today and talk about what is happening. And then I'm going to talk about a very special addition to the kernel that is being made. I've been following some of this open source development for a while. I want to talk about it. But anyways, Bcache continues to have issues after Linus made comments about the file system being experimental and seeing issue. Here's a post on the kernel lore email chain that kind of have started at all. I'll believe that when there are other major distributions that use it and you have lots of varied use, but it doesn't even show the issue. You aren't fixing a regression. You are doing new development to fix some old problem. And now you are literally adding non bcache files too. Enough is enough. Linus signs off on this one. This is all after Kent Overstreet had supplied a new enlarged pull request and Linus combated it right away with saying, yeah, no, enough is enough. The last pull was already big. This all led to Linus thinking about moving bcache FS over from an unstable development into an experimental side, saying that nobody sane uses Bcache FS and expects it to be stable, so every single user is on the experimental side. Well, that seemed to start off all sorts of things. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Bcache FS, Bcache FS is a copy on write file system for Linux based operating systems. Its, its primary developer is Kent Overstreet, who we just mentioned, and it was announced in 2015 and added to the Linux kernel starting with 6.7. That's somewhere in October 31st, 2023. Some of the features include an emphasis on reliability and robustness, and this is to compete against things like CFS and BTRFS. It includes a copy on write system, full data, metadata, checksumming, used on multiple devices, has replication, compression, encryption, snapshots, and offers a scalable, high performant, and low latency version of a file system. Now with that post from Linus himself, there has been a mixed overall community sentiment, and we're going to talk about that. But what's more interesting is that in Debian, Bcache tools, the user space tools for Bcache, FS are being orphaned. And this is by a maintainer, Jonathan, that says, I was tempted to remove it completely, but some suggested that I that I orphan it instead. I made an upload with the latest version to experimental and I'm removing it everywhere else. And this is quite wild after Linus had just posted about Bcache FS. Whether or not that's a coincidence, I don't know. But we do hear from Jonathan here in a post. Around a decade ago, I was happy to learn about Bcache, a Linux block cache system that implements a tiered storage system on Linux. At that stage, ZFS was nowhere close to where it is today. So any progress on gaining ZFS features in general Linux systems was very welcome. These days we care about it a little less in, in tiered storage systems. And since any cost benefit in using anything else than an NVMe tends to quickly evaporate compared to the time you eventually lose on it. So fast forwarding towards the end of 2023 version 1.2 shipped with some utilities written in Rust that caused a little delay since I wasn't familiar with Rust packaging yet. So I ship an update that didn't yet include those utilities and saw this as an opportunity to learn more about the Rust ecosystem and how it worked and, and Rust in Debian. And with a similar sediment as it stands now, Bcash FS tools, it is impossible to maintain in Debian stable, citing some of their concerns with doing this, with trying to maintain it in stable branch. That's why with this in mind, I decided to remove Bcash file system tools from Debian completely. Although after discussing with another DD, I was convinced to orphan it instead, which I have done now. I made an upload to experimental so that it is still available for someone who wants to work on it so they don't have to start new again. So it's been removed officially from the unstable branch so it doesn't migrate to testing, especially ancient versions that are unstable and old stable will be removed too. So it doesn't cause damages with any recent kernel versions that support Bcache FS. At the end, Jonathan says, and so my adventure with Bcache FS tools comes to an end. I'd advise you that if you consider using Bcache FS for any kind of production use in the near future, you should first consider how supportable it is long term and whether there's really anyone at all that is succeeding in providing a stable support for him. What a blow after the email chain with Linus to Bcache FS. After that, deprecation comes to Debian on some of the Bcache FS tools as well. Just hit or after hit this week on Bcache FS. But this kind of brings up an overall community sentiment that is a little bit of a divide between what I'll call traditionalists who value stability and maintainability. We can think of those people as, well, just like some of these Debian maintainers and those who advocate for more of a modern and flexible approach to software development and seeming tension between these two philosophies. We're about to get into the frustration on the Rust developer side of things. So stick around, make sure to smash that like button, and we're going to get into 
more of this saga as a lot has dropped in the last few days. You wouldn't want to miss this, so make sure to subscribe below as you'll get more videos like this. This all starts from Wedson. So a new email chain from Wedson giving their resignation as a kernel maintainer who's been working on Rust for Linux. Wedson first starts out by saying, hey folks, this is as short a series as one can be. Just remove myself as a maintainer of the, of the Rust for Linux project. I am retiring from the project. Almost after four years, I find myself lacking the energy and enthusiasm I once had to respond to some of the non-technical nonsense, so it's best to leave it up to those who still have it in them. They go to thank the Rust for Linux team and saying that they consider themselves lucky to have collaborated with such a talented and friendly group, wishing all the success to the project and truly believing that the future of kernels is with memory safe languages. I am no visionary, but if Linux doesn't internalize this, I'm afraid that's, that some other kernel will and Linux will end up with the Unix fate. Lastly, I'll leave a small three minute, 30 second sample context here and to reiterate, no one is trying trying to force anyone else to learn Rust nor prevent refactoring C code. Thanks, Wetson. So this all comes at the curtails of what we seemingly saw from Linus. And it seems like some of the Rust community developers are fed up with the way that some of their code is approached under additional scrutiny. Now, whether or not that's warranted, that's up to you. So let me know in the comment section what you believe on that portion of things. But we're going to keep going into some of the overall sentiment and response to Wetson leaving. There are definitely others who are making their thoughts known here. So we're going to read through some of that community sentiment, but here's some of Wetson's work on the memory allocation subsystem using Rust in the Linux kernel. This specifically focused on how to revamp the allocation crate in Rust, and they've done great work. Good luck, Weston, with whatever else you end up doing. Seems like Weston works or had worked for Microsoft for, and probably now, but they're choosing to focus on other things besides writing Rust in the Linux kernel. So here is another reply from a developer on the Acai Linux side of things. Lena here here on VT Social posts, I regretfully completely understand Wetson's frustrations. A subset of C kernel developers just seem to be determined to make the lives of the Rust maintainers as difficult as possible. They don't see Rust has as having value and would rather it just go away. They give examples of issues where their driver was not like other drivers, including the AMD GPU, and it fundamentally could not work. When they try to upstream minor fixes to C code to make the behavior more robust and lifetime requirements sensible, the maintainer blocked it and said they should just do what other drivers do. You can see the frustration that a developer would have getting feedback like that. Instead of getting useful feedback, it's pretty much, hey, redo this to match how other things work. They even pointed out that other C drivers also triggered the same bugs because the API was just bad and unintuitive and there are many secret hidden lifetime requirements. He wouldn't budge. One C driver works, so the rest drivers must work the same way. We can see the overall wanting to submit REST code and integrate it into the Linux kernel, especially as a strategic decision to future-proof against being able to continue Linux development in the future as languages do change. And while C is still rampant and being used all over, eventually and slowly it will distinguish into some other language. But does it make sense to even keep Rust in the Linux kernel? Does a new kernel need to be developed and rewritten in Rust? Do you keep those two away? Because there are a lot of issues and frustration that comes with trying to merge two languages together, especially with a massive open source community project like this. It's hard to manage the project, let alone manage multiple languages and multiple philosophies together. We continue with another maintainer's experience. This is Dave on the Linux Graph blog on Rust, Linux, developers, and maintainers. They mention some archetypes and make an analogy into roughly three categories called wayfinders, map makers, road builders, and road maintainers. They try to explain how the people who first pioneer or build some initial code, aka this hotel, in a place where it doesn't currently exist, saying, I want to go build a hotel somewhere, but there exists no map or path. I need to travel through a bunch of mountains, valleys, rivers, so on and so forth. I don't really care deeply about them. I just want to make the path go somewhere. I hit a roadblock, don't focus on it. I get around whatever necessary means I need to do to get another one. I document the route, leaving map signs. I build a hotel at the end. So basically just they get there, don't care attitude. Then you have the road builders. I see a hotel and pass someone has m marked out. So that's from the wayfinders, map makers. I foresee larger volumes will want to traverse the path and build more hotels or roadblocks that initial finder worked on. I will have to engage with them. I engage with each roadblock differently. I build bridges, dig tunnels, whatever is necessary to get the road built to the place where the wayfinder 
built the hotel. I work on each roadblock until I can open the road. Traffic, I can open it in stages, but the road needs to be completed. And finally, the road maintainers, I've got a road. I may have built the road initially. I may no longer build new roads. I really have no interest in hotels. I deal with intersections and roads controlled by other people. I interact with builders who want to build new intersections for new roads and remove older intersections for old roads. I fill in the holes, improve safety standards, and handle odd wayfinder wandering across eight lanes. So I think the pretense here is that the road builders and road maintainers all are built upon the first initial people who have created the path, no matter if it was the right path to get to the final hotel. And that leads to the different types of maintainers that we clearly are dealing with in the Linux community. People who are positive and engaged, positive with real concerns, negative with real, real concerns, negative with an unwilling and don't care disengaged. So where are we now? For maintainers to try and keep up with modern building, don't say 20 year old road roads are the pinnacle of innovation. Be willing to install the rumble strips, widen the lanes, add crash guardrails, and truck safety off ramps. Understand that wayfinders show you opportunities for longer term success, and the road builders are going to keep building the road, and the result is ultimately better if you engage positively. There's definitely some interesting thought here as most developers, at least initially, approach with a curious attitude for learning and remain positive, but as they traverse that path that Dave is suggesting, they ultimately become jaded by all the roadblocks, paths, detours, and building of those metaphorical hotels. There has to be a way that we can get together as a community and make things a little easier to maintain and build and work together more closely and better, or even redefine how we do things as a whole. It would be interesting to actually see a complete philosophy divide. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. That would mean a Linux in C kernel and a Linux in Rust kernel. Is it time to separate the two? I don't know, but I'm going to leave you with that interesting thought and get your opinion on it. As we've seen much frustration in the Rust developer community, many contributors are expressing their frustration with how Rust development practices get treated in Linux and the open source community, especially with how the last week has gone. As it seems, there are many people critical and opposed to Rust inclusion, although I think we can get there with thoughtful discussion on this topic and some reorganization to help loosen some of the developer and maintainer fatigue that comes with trying to introduce a whole new language to a kernel. Anyways, moving on to some awesome kernel news. I've been following this for a little while now. This is a PR request for the DRM Miscellaneous Next, which has one cool change in addition that I saw here in the midst of things, which is this panic section, optionally display a QR code. That's right, I've been following this for quite a while now. The development of a BSOD or blue screen of death in Linux for a kernel panic. And we can imagine it's sort of looking like any of these screens. Everyone probably has seen the blue screen of death or at least knows about it in Windows, but there is development on one, uh, especially for the DRM, which is the Direct Rendering Manager in Linux. This is what helps manage the graphics processing and is the interface for actually accessing graphics hardware. Anyways, you can imagine how nice it would be if your graphics system crashes, that you would get a message. Something like this is a good example, where you would get a QR code, kernel panic, it tell you you're going to reboot your computer and what actually triggered the crash. A little penguin that says, uh-oh, there's an exclamation and that QR code that gives you an extended information on on what actually happened. It's hard to debug kernel crashes, especially in graphics, because you kind of have to boot into a live system in order to go through the logs, which newcomers and new users in Linux have a hard time doing anyway. So this would just be a more accessible and easy way to kind of extend error handling to the user and even potentially help them submit issues that they run into to the developers and communities that actually maintain that code. Well, this is a wild week in news. There's definitely support for the Rust community in the Linux kernel out there. It's just gonna take some time to get everybody merged together. Together. I am very hopeful and optimistic that we can do that. There's definitely been skepticism by Debian and its maintainer here for BcacheFS, including Linus himself. I can definitely see some benefits to using Rust in a Linux kernel, including improved safety of making sure memory leaks don't exist, modernizing the kernel, and exposing any current C code issues. Will we see Rust contributions significantly impacting the Linux kernel? Will it subdivide? Only time will tell. As a community, we are currently a bit divided with strong opinions but I think we can work all that out. Let me know what you think about all this in the comment section below. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching. Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, 
and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to learn.savvynick.com now and get access to these sheets.